Welcome back to segment three. Now we're going to do a case study together in AI for Earth observation. You can take out a pen and paper and be ready if you have colleagues sitting with you. This is also a very good group exercise to do. I'm going to show you an image as you can see. What is this image? What do you see in this image? Take a moment and think about it. If you identified it as a slum, you are right. This actually is one of the major areas of research using AI for Earth observation. AI for Earth observation is being used to identify slums across the globe. Now, what might be some of the ethical issues that might arise from labeling or identifying an area as a slum? Take another moment and discuss it if you're sitting with your colleagues or think about it if you're sitting alone. What answers did you come up with? Perhaps you immediately identified that slums in region A of the world are not necessarily slums in region B, simply because of congested living. A country like Brazil or India, which has much higher population than most cities in Europe, slums in those regions, what might be called slums in Europe, will not be considered slums in these regions because the congestion level might be different. Also, what do you think about the people living within these regions? Would they like to be called slum dwellers? What might be the ethical consequence of being labeled a slum area when it comes to property prices? Perhaps me living in a posh region in Delhi, I think that I'm living in a posh region while I suddenly get labeled as a slum dweller. What will happen when I go to school? If I am indeed living in an economically weaker segment of society, which of a city, which gets labeled as a slum, what will people in my school call me if I am a student, a slum dweller, maybe in not very positive terms, it can be derogatory and therefore stigmatizing. Would any human being on the planet like for their privacy to be so encroached and for them to be called a slum dweller? especially when the socio-economic context or even the cultural context of that country or region doesn't justify me being called a slum dweller or my living area being so classified. This is a question of labeling and a question of socio-cultural differences that can lead to stigmatization and also therefore directly or indirectly a breach of privacy. In some regions of Africa, I have been told by students that the governments will, if they are told that a region is a slum, will remove it overnight, thereby rendering a large number of people without homes. Are these ethical consequences things that AI for EO researchers need to be worried about? You can think about it. You might say that this is not my problem. At the end of the day, I am doing my research. And finally, the policy makers need to decide whether or not they accept the labeling. Is it truly that way? If you think about it, a huge amount of taxpayers' money goes into funding academic research. And if academic research doesn't serve that same society, is it truly justified? Whatever we as academics do as fundamental research or as applied research is what then gets taken up either by the industry or the government and used for policy making. So at our level, already at the level of research, we need to rethink the labeling of areas as slums. Now let's apply our ethical theories that we learned in the previous segments to this ethical issue of slum identification using AI for Earth observation. Did you come up with a response based on either the consequentialist approach or the deontological approach? Think about it. Can you find a solution to this issue based on these approaches? You may have found indeed, yes, the consequentialist approach, given we understand the consequences of labeling an area as a slum, simply says, don't label an area as a slum. Duty-based approach says, 
you be careful about the basis on which you are labeling the area as a slum. Make sure that your data set is accurate enough or is at least representative enough to make a correct diagnosis or correct identification of an area as a slum or as not a slum. Now beyond this, however, we see that do we then say that all research in this area needs to freeze? We might say, well, that's not going to help because those areas that are accurately identified as slums, they definitely can be helped with this research where the governments can get an indication of which regions to prioritize when they want to do some development work, electrification work, adding uh, hygiene or fire safety. These are the regions that need first priority. Now, the question arises, can we apply different approaches to get a deeper answer to this question? And that's what we're going to look at now together. As I promised in the start, beyond the Western approaches, we'll also look at the Eastern approaches to ethical decision making. Let's jump right into it. In the Eastern approaches, one of the most popular theories, which is also known in the West, is the theory of karma. Now you might wonder, what is karma? If you don't know it, if you have heard the term, you might have also heard it in the context of every action has its consequences. And if you've done an action, then be ready for its consequences. But karma is not just about consequences of an action. If you look at the original theory of karma, karma has three facets to it. The first facet is the intention or the will that is driving a specific action. The second aspect of karma is the action itself. And only the third aspect of it is a consequence. So karma has all these three aspects. And therefore you will see that beyond the Western approaches, the theory of karma includes a new feature. And that is the feature of intention or will that is driving an action. Now you might say, okay, how does that help me? Let's go ahead and see how that helps. Let's go back to the slum example. When we look at this congested area, you as a researcher or as a policymaker, what is it that you intend to do when you label an area? You will see that the intention of labeling such an area is to improve the quality of life for these people, right? Now, can we accomplish the same intended purpose with a different label than the label of slum? Yes, there can be multiple labels. It can be area called congested area of living, area without electrification, area with possible fire hazards. These make the problems of that area as identified from congested living a little bit more explicit without causing a stigma to the people who live there. Yet accomplishing perhaps more minutely and more comprehensively the problems that these areas face. You can see therefore that in earth observation research, simply modifying the research question can help avoid several ethical complications. So let's go forward now with the Eastern approaches to ethical decision making. You see that the theory of karma, coming back to it, is still very closely connected to the duty of a person. Let's take another example here. Say, I ask you, is it ethical or unethical for me to cut your stomach with a knife? Take a moment to answer that question. You may have very nicely answered, it is absolutely unethical for me to cut your stomach with a knife. But can you say that cutting somebody's stomach with a knife per se, this action is always unethical? No. If it is a surgeon cutting someone's stomach to save his or her life, it is definitely an ethical action. However, there are two things that go into determining whether this is an ethical action, even if it's by a doctor. First, what is the intention with which the surgeon is cutting your stomach? Is it with the intention of simply making more money and billing it to the insurance companies? Or is it with truly the intention of healing you? But you will see here that this is not adequate. You also need to see 
what are the capabilities or skills or knowledge set of the person who is cutting your stomach? Is it a general person, general doctor who has never learned surgery? Then he is not justified or even doing an ethical act by cutting open your stomach. But if it is a qualified surgeon who knows how to do it and he is doing it with the intention of saving your life, then this action becomes very much ethical. Now, interestingly, in the Eastern philosophy, intention and duty when combined and be on the, if, if these two are on the right side, then whatever the consequences of those actions are will not be uh, finally um, indicating whether the original action was ethical or not. Say with all good intention, the doctor cuts open your stomach to remove, say, a tumor and at the end of the surgery, despite the best efforts and best intentions of the doctor, you, the surgery was not successful. You will not call that action of the doctor an unethical action, even though the consequence was not what you wanted. Here you will see how Eastern approaches can sometimes be different from Western approaches because consequences are not given so much importance in all Eastern approaches to ethical decision making. There is an understanding that consequences are not always in a person's hand as much as our intentions and actions. Interestingly here, there is a mythological figure in Eastern philosophy. His name is Skanda. This mythological figure is common in both, both East, um, Indian as well as Tibetan philosophy. Skanda is in Chinese and Tibetan philosophy the protector of dharma. Dharma, a new concept, is essentially another word for duty. What is the righteous or correct action? And in Tibetan and Chinese philosophy, this skanda, this, the imagery of skanda is essentially shown as the protector of those who are doing ethical actions by correctly understanding their duties. In Eastern philosophy, in Indian philosophy, the imagery of skanda is even more elaborate. If you see this image of a, an artistic depiction of Skanda, you will see he is surrounded by two goddesses. On his left side is um, the goddess Valli and on the right is the goddess Devsena. Valli in Indian philosophy is a symbol of human will or intention and Devsena is a symbol of human action. While Skanda himself, as I said, is the protector of dharma and therefore the symbol of knowledge. And interestingly, these three powers of human intention, human action and human knowledge are the three things that are taken into account when determining whether an action is ethical or not. Now, how can this be applied for daily analysis of our research work? We have developed a, a six-step approach for, ident for application of this um, three-pronged approach. First, you have to look into what is the intention that is driving your own research. Evaluate whether this intention is compliant with ethical principles that we have already studied. Next, you need to look into what actions or steps you need to take to make that intention come into fruition. You also need to check whether those actions itself are ethical. So let's take a very extreme example. Say the intention of your research is to reduce global population levels. It is a good, it is a very good uh, intention because pop heavy populations can lead to several problems. However, you decide that the way you're going to do it is by bombing a certain segment of the world's population. Now, even though your intention was good, the method of accomplishing that or the action is highly unethical and illegal. So you have to also see if the actions itself are in compliance with ethical principles, human rights and human values. Third, here of course this means you need to have educated yourself or given yourself the knowledge of what are the ethical principles and that is what we are doing in this lecture. You need to then look into see whether each of the steps that you have taken for accomplishing your goal 
are actually aligned with your stated intention. And finally, you need to confirm that the actions once executed are also accomplishing the expressed intention. With these five steps, you can also cyclically go back to the intention and understand whether you need to modify your intentions or your research questions to accomplish a better ethical outcome as we did with our case study on slums. I welcome you to look into this approach and this three pronged steps of knowledge, intention and action every time you are analyzing whether an act that you did or plan to do is ethical or not. You will be surprised to see that once you align your intentions and your actions with globally accepted human values and with ethical principles, human rights principles, it is most likely going to be the case that the consequences of your research are ethical. I wish you a wonderful journey with ethics in AI for Earth observation and hope that you will find the application of the principles you've learned today to be very easy to apply in your daily research and reach more ethically uh, positive outcomes with your daily research. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us anytime. Thank you.